Good morning. A special welcome to any visitors that are with us here this morning. We certainly are grateful for you choosing this as a place of worship as we are nurtured and fed on the Word of God and also the Lord's Supper. Uh, we offer that to those within our communicant fellowship of the Wisconsin Evangelical Lutheran Synod. We praise God recognizing his certainly amazing grace as uh, that will be demonstrated in the gospel reading and Pastor Schneider sharing that word with us. Uh, if you're looking ahead in this order of service here, uh, the, the Lord's Prayer, we will say the Lord's Prayer in the traditional way. The, the, the program that we use uh, defaults to the newer version and it just didn't get changed, that's all. So the screens will be right and we'll be using the traditional version. In case you're looking ahead and wondering what's going on here. <laughs> Um, we'll open now with the singing of hymn uh, 920, Christ is Made the Sure Foundation.
Please stand. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, God is faithful and just, and will forgive us our sins, and purify us from all unrighteousness. Let us confess our sins to the Lord. Holy God, gracious Father, I am sinful by nature and have sinned against you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I deserve your punishment both now and forever. But Jesus, my Savior, paid for my sins with his innocent suffering and death. Trusting in him, I pray, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. Our gracious Father in heaven, has been merciful to us. He sent his only son, Jesus Christ, who gave his life as the atoning sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ and by his authority, I forgive you all your sins in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. In peace, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace from above and for our salvation, let us pray to the Lord. For the peace of the whole world, for the well-being of the Church of God, and for the unity of all, let us pray to the Lord. For this holy house and for all who offer here their worship and praise, let us pray to the Lord. Help, save, comfort, and defend us, gracious Lord. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, by your great goodness, mercifully look upon your people that we may be governed and preserved evermore in body and soul through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. You may be seated as we give our attention to that word of God. God's word is found for us in the words, the inspired word of God in Isaiah 43, reminding us of God's great goodness and his earnest desire to feed us, to save us, and to always be with us. This is what the Lord says. He who made a way through the sea, a path through the mighty waters, who drew out the chariots and horses, the army and the reinforcements together, and they lay there never to rise again, extinguished, snuffed out like a wick. Forget the former things. Do not dwell on the past. See, I am doing a new thing. Now it springs up. Do you not perceive it? I am making a way in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland. The wild animals honor me, the jackals and owls and the owls, because I provide water in the wilderness and streams in the wasteland to give drink to my people, my chosen, the people I formed for myself, that they may proclaim my praise. The word of the Lord. The choir will now sing their special song.
The next portion of God's word is found for us in Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, chapter 3. And these words are perhaps some of the, the most precious words elevating not only the righteousness of Christ, but the importance of Christ in our lives. More important than life itself. More important than anything that you have, anything besides Christ as he will say here, is really garbage. If someone else thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more. Circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regard to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, as for righteousness, based on the law, faultless. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. I consider them garbage, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, not having a righteousness of my own that comes from the law, but that which is through faith in Christ, the righteousness that comes from God on the basis of faith. I want to know Christ, yes, to know the power of his resurrection and participation in his sufferings, becoming like him in his death, and so somehow attaining to the resurrection from the dead. Not that I have already obtained all this or have already arrived at my goal, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. Brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of it, but one thing I do, Forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead, I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. The word of the Lord. Be to God. We sing now the hymn of the day, O God, O Lord of heaven and earth.
The lesson for our sermon focus is the Gospel of St. Luke, chapter 20. Please rise. He that is Jesus went on to tell this par- to tell the parable the, I'm sorry Jesus went on to tell the people this parable A man planted a vineyard rented it to some farmers and went away for a long time At harvest time he sent a servant to the tenants so they would give him some of the fruit of the vineyard but the tenants beat him and sent him away empty-handed He sent another servant but That one also they beat and treated shamefully and sent away empty-handed. He sent still a third, and they wounded him and threw him out. Then the owner of the vineyard said, What shall I do? I will send my son, whom I love. Perhaps they will respect him. But when the tenants saw him, they talked the matter over. This is the heir, they said. Let's kill him, and the inheritance will be ours. So they threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. What then will the owner of the vineyard do to them? He will come and kill those tenants and give the vineyard to others. When the people heard this, they said, God forbid. Jesus looked directly at them and asked, Then what is the meaning of that which is written? The stone the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. Everyone who falls on that stone will be broken to pieces. Anyone on whom it falls will be crushed. The teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him immediately because they knew he had spoken this parable against them, but they were afraid of the people. The Gospel of the Lord. You may be seated. Dear Christian friends, the context of this parable is important. Jesus was proclaiming the good news to people there in those temple courts. And it's also worthy of note the time this happened. It was the Tuesday before Passover, and there were people who had come in from countries all around, particularly to Jerusalem and particularly to that temple. Jesus saw this as a great opportunity to preach forgiveness to those who needed to hear it. At the same time, there were the religious leaders, the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law. And they came up to Jesus and they questioned his authority and and why he thought he was able to teach in this way. As part of his response, Jesus gave them two pictures. One, a parable of a vineyard and a landowner, and the other, the picture of a stone which was rejected that became a cornerstone. Both of these two pictures tell us of God's patient love. So let's consider that first picture, the parable of the vineyard. In this parable, there was a landlord who had worked out a deal with some tenants. They were renters on his property. And the deal was that they could live and work at his vineyard, and they would take a a fair share of the crops themselves. Meanwhile, the landowner would then take a portion for himself when the harvest came. Now, vineyards were very common in Jesus' day. In fact, it was probably... Most, if not everyone, knew where they could find a vineyard. And some of these people might have even worked a vineyard at one point or another in their lives. This kind of a a, a deal, uh, a land contract, was very common in Jesus' day. And the landlord was being very fair. But after they had worked out their deal, and the landlord went away, the harvest did come. And that landlord returned. He sent a servant in his place to collect some of that crop. But they wouldn't hand it over. Those tenants wouldn't pay their due. Instead, they they beat him 
and they sent him away empty-handed. That servant didn't deserve that. After all, he was just a messenger. That landlord didn't deserve that either. This was the deal they had worked out. So the landlord sent another servant, thinking maybe they'll do right this next time. The second servant, they also would send away empty-handed, but not before beating him and treating him shamefully. So then the landlord was still patient. He sent a third servant, again trying to collect his due. And this servant, they treated even worse than the first two. They wounded him. They didn't just beat him. They, they possibly left some scars. And they didn't just send him away. They threw him out. And you can picture the force behind this as they're throwing him out. And then again, they sent him away empty-handed. It wasn't fair. But why did that landlord go through these lengths already? Why didn't he just call in those soldiers to enforce the law? After all, he, he had every right in his contract to demand that portion of the crop. And now they had broken these other laws in the way they had mistreated his servants. Why would the landlord continue to put up with all this? I mean, somebody might think, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, shame on me. But you're not going to fool me that third time. Yet with this landlord, he had already been fooled, so to speak, three times. And now he was even considering a fourth. This fourth time he was considering sending his son, the heir, the firstborn, his beloved son. And why would he send his son into a situation like that? Why would he send him in knowing the way that things had already gone and how they were only getting worse? Why would he risk his son in that way? Why would he be so slow to execute justice? A much better question to ask is why would God deal with us the same way? Why would God be so slow to send his justice? Why would he be so slow to punish us for our sins? Because when we hear God's word, we don't always hear it gladly. There are times when we do hear that word of God, we, we, we listen, we understand, we hear it, but we don't really like what's being said. Our sinful nature kicks against it. We don't want to hear what God has to say. There are those times that we certainly push off God's word. We don't take those opportunities, even though we've got the time and the schedule for it. We don't sit down for devotion with the family. We don't take time for Bible study. We, we miss church, even though we might have well been here. We don't take those chances because we don't value that word rightly. And what about those times when we don't even need to read the scriptures because we already know in our hearts what the right thing is to do. We don't need any extra clarification or understanding. We already know what God wants. We just choose not to. We just don't want to. Far too easily we are selfish and greedy in so many ways. 
we far more easily consider how we might purchase something for ourselves rather than sharing our abundance with somebody in need. We far prefer to surround ourselves with friends who can stand on their own two feet in many different ways rather than trying to befriend somebody who really needs us. A listening ear, time, energy, yes, financial gifts too. We far more easily consider how we can increase our own net worth than we can consider how we might actually grow God's kingdom and spread his word. Time and again, we prove ourselves to be selfish and self-centered, concerned about our affairs and our desires rather than God's affairs and his desires. And for all of these sins, whatever they may be, God is right to punish. So why doesn't he just come down and do it already? It's love. Patient love. It's amazing, astounding, patient love on the part of God. In the parable, that owner didn't want to get the law involved because he really didn't want to come down on those tenants. When it comes to God, he's not very quick to swing the axe or slam down the hammer. Not on us. Because he's patient because he does love us. Now in the story, we, we saw what happened when the owner did send his son. They threw him out of the vineyard and killed him. That firstborn son, that beloved son, and this is how they treated him. Worse than the other three servants who had already come before. And they had this crazy thought that if they did this, they would somehow profit in the end. And that, that wouldn't happen in our society today, and it wasn't the way the law worked back in Jesus' day either. No, at this point, they had not only broken the law in multiple ways, now they had very clearly violated their land contract, forfeited any right to be on that property, any right to sharing its crops, and now that they had also even forfeited their own right to life after how they treated this son and heir. Now again, Jesus was telling this story just days before Passover. He chose to be there in Jerusalem, of all places. He chose to be there at the temple, of all places. And Jesus knew that city well. It had quite the reputation behind it, especially after all the prophets over the years that had been sent to Jerusalem. There are many unfortunate examples of how Jerusalem persecuted and rejected those whom God had sent. But rather than going through too many examples, let's simply sum it all up as we see in Acts chapter 7, where it asks, which of the prophets did your fathers not persecute? A rhetorical question. God didn't have to be kind to us and patient like that. He could have just walked away. He could have left us in sin and death, knowing that we couldn't get out, knowing there was no way that on our own strength, that on our own effort, on our own merit, we could have ever helped ourselves but God is patient and forgiving. He loves you. And so he did everything he could to rescue you. When all other plans had failed, when all other options were already exhausted, he did send his one and only son, his beloved son. And he came into this world to be our sacrifice. We read about how they treated that son, very similar to what happened in this parable. As they threw that son outside the vineyard and killed him, so too, 
as it says in Hebrews 13, Jesus suffered outside the gate for this reason, to sanctify people by his own blood. That is to say, he was made to carry his cross through the street. And just outside that city of Jerusalem, just outside the wall, there he was nailed to that cross along with the charge that, was, that he was found guilty of. And as he hung there, it served as a warning to all those passers-by who would either come or go just outside that city gate to see that this is what happens when you break the law badly enough. Don't be like him, it warned. Jesus specifically brings up the way that he would be rejected as he quoted then Psalm 118. He says the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone. There's a picture here of, again, God's patient love in that even, even those builders who were going to reject their Savior, God still showed them patience. Again, it was days before Passover, days before Jesus will be crucified. And he knew what was coming. In the, the picture here, we can think about this building that is being built. We can picture a, a pile of stones that had been delivered so that they could set it up into a building, into a wall, a stone wall. And somewhat in the fashion that you might put together a jigsaw puzzle, they would piece together a wall as tightly fitted as possible so that it would be nice and strong and straight. But as they picked up that next stone and looked at it and examined it, they looked it over and it didn't seem to be like the rest. It had a different kind of a shape and quality to it. And so those builders thought, well, what am I going to do with this? It doesn't seem to fit along with the rest of these stones in the wall. So they chucked it to the side. They reserved it for the dump heap, ready to be hauled away. The problem was this was the grave mistake. While they did accurately estimate that this stone was different, they didn't realize it was different because it was so special, so unique, so priceless and valuable. It was different because it was in a class all on its own, not meant to be just an ordinary stone along with the rest of the stones in that wall, but rather because it was meant for a different purpose, to be the cornerstone of the whole building, that stone upon which the entire building would line up and stand. And this is a picture for Christ. We know how the religious leaders looked at Jesus when he came. He wasn't the kind of savior they thought he was going to be. He wasn't the man they were looking for. They didn't understand who the Messiah would truly be. And so when they looked at Jesus, they even accused him of sin. They accused him that he was breaking the Sabbath law. And they accused him that he was lying in God's name because he claimed to be equal with God. And so it was that when they were there at the temple offering their regular sacrifices for so many years, that when the sacrifice that was sent by God, that Lamb of God actually entered into those temple courts, they didn't recognize that sacrifice. When the sacrifice to literally end all sacrificing had come, they planned to kill him. And though they had spent so many years studying God's word, listening to that word of God, when the word of God became flesh and walked among them, when he walked among those temple courts, again they plotted his demise. They wouldn't put up with what he was saying. Still, Jesus knew all this was going to happen. He knew how it was going to unfold and still he persisted on. He knew where he was going to end up, but he still wanted to reach out as much as possible 
to save as many as possible along the way. I'm astounded that Jesus not only preached and taught to those people who would condemn him and crucify him, but that even as he was being condemned and crucified, hanging there on the cross, he still used some of those final breaths to speak blessing upon them and pray for them. Father, forgive them. All this happened. And it says that that very hour, the teachers of the law and the chief priests looked for a way to arrest him. It happened on God's timetable, not theirs. Now, I know that the religious leaders thought that they were in charge of all this, that they were the ones taking action here. And they did have in mind to get rid of Jesus, but they thought they might do it in a, in a kind of secret and, de and deceptive way. They didn't want this to be public. They didn't want the crowds to see and know what was going on. They were afraid that there might be a riot. There were so many people in town. And if there was a riot, what then? Not only might there be people who were hurt along the way, but also Pontius Pilate might have stepped in and shut the city down under a curfew and said, your festival is over. Go home. They didn't want that. So they had thought, not during the festival. Still, this was God's timetable. God was using these events to bring about the salvation that he had planned. And he made sure that Jesus not only died that particular Passover, but that he would fulfill it once and for all. And in this great sacrifice, we see God's grace to us, his love for us. We see his great patience with us as he continually invites us to come back to him in Christ's name and to lay down our burdens, our guilt, our sins, to confess it all and lay it all down there at the cross where Christ freely forgives. So today I want you to, con to, to continue to lay hold of God's forgiveness to count and depend on God's patience for you because he is patient and loving. I want you to see Jesus as your complete savior. And I want you to walk away remembering these two pictures. One, the patience of that vineyard owner who did not want to bring the hammer down. And the other, the picture of the stone that was rejected, which became the cornerstone. This too being a picture of God's patience. Because along the way, he continually preached forgiveness even to people who would reject him. And even after he rose, he was still using his prophets to try and win those very same people over. What patient love our God has for us. What blessing he has for us. And what comfort in his patient love. Amen. Please rise. And now may that peace of God which surpasses all understanding keep and guard your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. We now confess our common faith with the words of the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven 
and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshiped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. We continue with the prayer of the church. Before we use the prayer that is uh, on a screen and in your service folder, we'll offer a prayer of intercession for all who mourn the passing of Pastor Godfrey, who this past Tuesday uh, went to his heavenly home. O oh Lord Jesus, head of the church and chief shepherd of your flock, it has pleased you to call Pastor Godfrey from this earthly life to heavenly glory. While we mourn his death, we rejoice in the eternal victory he now shares with you. We thank you for the blessings you bestowed on your servant, Pastor Godfrey, for bringing him to faith, for preserving him in faith, and for giving him the joy of publicly proclaiming your word and administering your sacraments. You have kept him faithful to your word and made him a blessing to us and to many others. Grant a special measure of comfort to his family as they mourn his loss and give healing to their sorrowing hearts through the precious assurance of your word, may the death of this pastor remind us all of the frailty of life, and may your Holy Spirit ever keep before us the goal of everlasting life. Hear us and comfort us for Jesus' sake. Amen. We further pray, gracious Lord, we fall before you with great awe and wonder that you willingly gave up your Son as our rescuer and Savior. You so love the world with this blessing of your special care and concern for our eternal well-being. Open our eyes. Savior and rescuer, for 33 years, you labored in order to purchase each one of us to be your very own possession. You endured such great rejection and scorn along with brutal mistreatment and crucifixion. You did this all in order to buy us and give us freedom from sin, death, and hell. What amazing grace. You alone are truly our priceless treasure. Though the Blessed Holy Spirit, keep us firm in your word and also firmly holding on to Jesus as the cornerstone of our lives. By your sacrament of Holy Communion, bless all participants with a firmer gr grasp of your grace and mercy that ultimately wells up to eternal life in heaven. My Hear us and bless us according to your amazing grace in Christ Jesus our Lord. Amen. We gather now our thank offerings.
Please stand. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is truly good and right that we should at all times and in all places give you thanks, O Lord, Holy Father, Almighty and Everlasting God, through Jesus Christ our Lord, who brought the gift of salvation to all people by his death on the tree of the cross, so that the devil who overcame us by a tree would in turn by a tree be overcome. Therefore, with all the saints on earth and the hosts of heaven, we praise your holy name and join their glorious song. We give thanks to you, O God, through your dear Son, Jesus Christ, whom you sent to be our Savior, our Redeemer, and the messenger of your grace. Through him you made all things. In him you are well pleased. He is the incarnate Word, conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. To fulfill your promises, he stretched out his hands on the cross and released from eternal death all who believe in him. As we remember Jesus' death and resurrection, we thank you that you have gathered us together to receive your Son's body and blood. Send us your Spirit, unite us as one, and strengthen our faith so that we may praise you in your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him, we glorify and honor you, O God, our Father, and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. And we pray together his prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the same night he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it. And he gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And then also, in the same way, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it to his disciples, saying, Drink from it, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you, for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
please stand. Give thanks to the Lord, for he is good. Whenever we eat this bread and drink this cup, We give thanks, Almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this saving gift. We pray that through it you will strengthen our faith in you and increase our love for one another. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. With believing hearts, receive God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. The Lord look on you with his favor and give you peace. You may be seated as we sing the closing hymn, My Hope is Built on Nothing Less.
Greetings to all of you again. Uh, just a few things to highlight. Uh, we have adult Bible class right after uh, dismissing here, uh, continuing our study on the life of Abraham. And uh, tonight there is a sacred concert uh, of Illinois Lutheran schools, and that is at Trinity, uh, just down the road. And Wednesday is our last midweek Lenten service. Uh, we have one at 3.30 and another at 7 o'clock, uh, with a meal being served in between, hosted by the Women's Bible Study. And, oh, one, one important thing. Uh, uh, John Godfrey did call, I did talk to him on Friday as far as what the arrangements are for a funeral or memorial service for Pastor Godfrey. And he told me that it would not happen until the later part of June. That's when all the kids and family could get together. So that's so that you know. And when those specifics are available, I'll share those with you as well. Have a blessed day.